This video is about the last part of chapter 6, the law of universal gravitation and orbits. So starting with a little bit of history background. In the 1570s, Polish astronomer Copernicus revived an ancient idea that the Sun was at the center of the universe and the Earth and planets orbited around it in circular paths. Um, prior to this, everyone assumed that the Earth was at the center of the universe and all the other objects in the solar system orbited around the Earth in circular orbits, including the Sun. There was an astronomer named Aristarchus who hypothesized that the Earth was at the center and uh, it got rejected because people said we can't detect the motion, not knowing anything about reference frames. In the 1610s, uh, Johannes Kepler from Germany came at this from a different way and he said the circular orbit model by Copernicus is not predicting where the planets are going to be on any given night accurately enough. I'm going to keep the Sun at the center of the universe but I'm going to try other shapes for the paths. And he found the one that actually fit best was the ellipse. So this diagram should remind you of some of the properties of ellipses. They have a long axis through the center called the major axis, and then they have a shorter one perpendicular to it called the minor axis. The perimeter that's most important for us is half the length of the major axis called the semi-minor axis, semi-major axis. The closest point to the sun is called the perihelion and the farthest point from the sun is called the aphelion. If you click on the URL in the PDF version of this, it'll take you to some more explanation about the shapes of ellipses. So that was what was came known as Kepler's first law, that planets orbit the sun in elliptical orbits. He also put together something known as Kepler's second law, which said that the area swept out by a line joining the planet to the sun sweeps out equal amounts of area in equal amounts of time. So what these are saying is in the picture, if these dots are all the same time apart, then the areas of those two blue triangles will be the same. What it really boils down to is Kepler's second law says that planets speed up and slow down as they move around the sun. They're moving faster near perihelion and slower near aphelion. And again, the link will take you to more information about Kepler's laws. Kepler was a big believer in harmony, both in music and in scientific laws, and he believed there should be some proportionality, some ratio between the time it takes a planet to orbit the Sun and the length of its semi-major axis. He tried a wide variety of powers, exponents, and found that for the planets in the solar system that he knew about, which was out through Saturn, the period squared was proportional to the semi-major axis cubed. The rest of the planets in the solar system, including the minor planets and the asteroids, all fall on this line too, even the ones that were discovered well after Kepler's times. The graph that's shown here comes from hyperphysics, and it shows the cube of the semi-major axis plotted versus the square of the orbital period. And you can see that all of the data for the planets falls on a nice, perfect straight line, meaning that the period squared is proportional to the semi-major axis cubed. Roughly the same time, Galileo in Italy was doing some work in physics and astronomy. He showed that falling bodies accelerate. The legend is he did this by dropping things out of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. We don't have any evidence of that. But there is evidence in his surviving notebooks that he rolled objects down inclined planes and measured their acceleration. The purpose of the inclined plane is so that the normal force cancels out most of the gravity, making a smaller acceleration that was easier to time with his primitive clocks. He also realized that if they were accelerating, that meant they were being acted on by a force coming from the Earth, and he called that gravity. That's simply the Latin word for weight. Remember that Galileo developed the Newton's first law of motion, 
that objects won't accelerate unless acted on by a net force. He also made some important obs astronomical observations that showed that Kepler and Copernicus were on the right track and that having the Earth in the center of the solar system wasn't necessarily a great idea. The most important of these is he discovered that Jupiter is accompanied by several moons, um, which proves immediately that the Earth is not the center of all rotation in the solar system. Robert Hooke in England, about 50 years later, came up with uh, some information that led into our ideas about gravity. He looked at the conical pendulum, which you've been doing some work on the last couple of homework assignments. In the conical pendulum, as it moves around in its horizontal circle, there's always a component of the tension pointing towards the center of the circle. This told Hooke that uh, there must be some force coming from the Sun to be responsible for the Earth's circular or elliptical motion around the Sun. So whatever the Sun is doing to make the Earth orbit it, it must point directly at the Sun. We call that a central force. Not long after, Newton um, came up with a hypothesis about the nature of this force, called it gravity. In Galileo's world, gravity was only a property of the Earth. It was not a property of everything in the universe. Newton said um, gravity must be universal, so every mass in the universe attracts every other mass. And he suggested that the force of attraction between two point masses was given by the force law you see over at the right side. That the force is proportional to the product of the masses and inversely proportional to the distance between them squared. Um, forces are vectors, and so he had to come up with a direction for that, and he followed Hooke's lead on that and said that the direction of the gravitational attraction was always directly at the center of the attracting body. In this equation, r does not refer to the radius of the planet. It refers to the distance between the centers of the planets, as the diagram shows in the lower right corner. He was able to show, using this assumption and his three laws of motion, why Kepler's orbits, discoveries about orbits, are true. He originally developed this for point masses, very small objects, but he was able to show through a geometric proof that this works for spherical objects if the distance is measured from the center. So this is important when you're doing calculations about planetary orbits or satellite orbits that you don't measure the height or distance to the satellite from the surface of the planet, it has to be measured from the center. It was more than 100 years later before someone make a, made a good reliable estimate of that constant that appears in the law of universal gravitation. One of the reasons for that is because it's really quite small. You can see the number there. What that number means is that the gravitational attraction between two one kilogram masses placed one meter apart is only 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11th of a Newton. So what do we have to have for gravity to be a significant or a large force? The only way you're going to get a significantly large gravitational force is if the uh, mass of one of the objects is very large. Uh, we now know from using the law of universal gravitation that the mass of the Earth is about 6 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. We can use this idea about universal gravitation to determine what the freefall acceleration on the surface of a planet would be. We substitute Newton's law of universal gravitation in for the net force, because if an object is, is in freefall, gravity is the only force acting on it. Then we substitute in g for the acceleration and solve both sides. The notation I switched to on this slide is common in your textbook where 
the mass of the main attracting body is done with capital M and the falling or orbiting body is done with a lowercase m. So this tells us that the gravitational acceleration is proportional to mass and inversely proportional to the radius of a planet. So here's a ranking task to see if you can manipulate this. Pause the movie here and try and figure out what if a planet was twice as massive as the Earth but had the same radius, how would its acceleration differ? What if it was the same mass but half the radius, how would it differ? And what if it was twice the mass and half the radius, both? Here are the results. If the planet is twice as massive, then the factor that's going into the numerator is twice as big, which leads to an increase in the acceleration so that it'll be twice as much as the Earth's. It's inversely proportional to the distance squared, so putting a one-half in the denominator leads to multiplying by four. And if you do both of those things, we'll end up multiplying by eight. Kepler's first law tells us that the planets orbit in ellipses. But you remember from trigonometry class and geometry class that a circle is actually a special case for an ellipse. So the orbits can be circular. We'll be working primarily with circular orbits in this class because the mathematics is simpler. So what we can do is we can learn things about the circular orbit by remembering that the acceleration of an object in a circle is v squared over r. It's a centripetal acceleration after all. Even though the speed is constant, it still accelerates and the direction is towards the center of the circle, which means at the sun. So we substitute in universal gravitation again. We substitute in the centripetal acceleration uh, on the right side of Newton's second law, and then we can solve this for the speed. And what we find out is that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the radius of the orbit and the speed. So if the orbit goes higher, what happens to the orbiting body? Does it speed up or slow down? So larger r would decrease v. And conversely, a smaller r would increase v. Since the orbit is circular, we know that there's a nice simple relationship between the radius of the orbit, the speed, and the time it takes to complete one orbit, a period. So if we take the expression for v that was on the previous slide and this expression for v and set them together and do some manipulation, what pops out is Kepler's third law. where the period squared is proportional to the radius of the circular orbit cubed. And it turns out that the proportionality constant is here, 4 pi squared over g times big M. The mathematics is a little bit more difficult, but you can also show that this is true for an elliptical orbit. The only difference is the semi-major axis replaces the radius. One problem with Newton's law of universal gravitation is that um, there's no mechanism by how this force is generated and how it's able to cross empty space between objects. Even Newton recognized this flaw in his own book. He said, I don't have a hypothesis to answer this. Uh, another flaw that was discovered later was there's no mention of time in Newton's law of universal gravitation which indicates that gravity is exchanged between two objects with zero time delay. That also means that it has an infinite speed and 
the special theory of relativity tells us that nothing can have a speed greater than that of light in vacuum. Einstein recognized this as a flaw after developing the special theory of relativity, and he started working on a way to describe gravity that did not have these flaws in it. So his idea is that the universe is a four-dimensional uh, entity joined together of space and time, and that that four-dimensional space-time is curved by the presence of mass or energy. In Newton's world, planets follow a curved path because there's a force acting on them and that force causes an acceleration. In this case, the acceleration is both a change in direction and a change in speed. Einstein's idea of gravity is that there is no force. Gravity is caused by a curvature, so the orbiting objects are just following the natural curved path through curved space-time. There's nothing that needs to be exchanged back and forth between the attracting object and the one being attracted, so there's no travel time problem. In the world of general relativity, the difference that occurs between Newton's model and the general relativistic model isn't really significant unless space-time is strongly curved, meaning there's a lot of mass nearby or a lot of energy. So when NASA wants to send something to Mars, they don't worry about general relativity, they just use universal gravitation. In the solar system, the only thing we need to worry about for general relativity is Mercury's orbit, because it's the one that's closest to the Sun. General relativity, however, has a failure at small distances inside an atom. It's inconsistent with quantum mechanics and the way that it describes how atoms work. And we don't have an answer for that yet. A lot of people are working on ways to uh, come up with a, a model for gravity that is consistent in all three of these areas, where space-time is flat, where space-time is strongly curved, and inside an atom.